I don't think I've ever watched an episode where an info dump was quite as tense as this was. The entire time Nanahoshi and Ridius were talking, I was completely enthralled as the mysteries of Season 1 unraveled before me. That's not to say that everything was explained, but out of the stuff that was, I gotta admit I wasn't really expecting any of it. I did have my suspicions of Nanahoshi just like how Ridius did, but never once did it cross my mind that the teleportation incident could have been a byproduct of her summoning. It was a massive reveal I'm sure a lot of you are dying to know more about. So, what can you expect for cut content in an episode as important as this? Well, in addition to a lot of intricate details regarding summoning in magic circles, the core parts left out were actually related to Nanahoshi, specifically what happened to her and how it is she ended up here. There's also a bit more information on the teleportation incident itself, but as an extra bonus I went back and reread the events of these scenes here. Additional context from the moment of that might provide a bit more insight now that we know the nature of why this incident happened. So let's do as we usually do and take a look at what the anime left out from the novels. But first, I'm super excited to share today's sponsor with you, a game I'm deeply invested in and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. The strategic anime styled RPG with an immersive story, expansive base building, and a whole lot of characters. That's right, I'm talking about the mobile game Arknights, an already massive sci-fi universe that's about to get a whole lot bigger with their newest collaboration with Monster Hunter. Not only will this crossover bring us to a mysterious village sprawling with Monster Hunter's notorious Rathalos, but the new operators from the event all feature attacks iconic to the series. So if you're a fan of Monster Hunter and its heavy hitting combos, then I'm sure you'll recognize Yato's Blade Dance and Noir's Spirit Helm Breaker, both of which are core to these crossover exclusive operators and can be unlocked to help unravel the greater mystery behind the event's story. After which you'll receive the One Star Terror Research Commission operator for free. There's also a whole bunch of rewards to be gained including the Operator, Elite Materials, Headhunting Permits, and more. So, if you want to experience Monster Hunter in the world of Arknights, then I highly recommend using the link in the description to download it for free today. But now, let's get back to the video. Episode 33, The White Mask, covering chapters 5 and 6 from Volume 9 of the Light Novel. Starting things off in the library, there was a bit more to why Rudy thought teleportation was similar to summoning magic. Not only were the magic circles for both very much alike, but the color of the magical energy emitted when both were activated were almost identical to each other too. It seemed the only difference was that one could transport humans while the other couldn't. No matter how much Rudy scoured through records, myths, ancient histories, and legends, not a single one included a reference to a person being summoned. It was as if this was a rule that applied to all races and people equally. This didn't really pertain to his research involving the displacement incident, but something about it just made Rudy curious. You see, sure you couldn't summon a person with all their flesh and blood, but what about if it was just their soul? What if you could summon the spirit of a person who was dead? This wasn't something Rudy was dying to figure out, but if he did ever get the opportunity to meet an expert in summoning, then the possibility of doing that was something he'd definitely inquire to them. It was a question that would have to wait since no professor in the school had even the slightest specialization in summoning. There were a few members in the Magician's Guild who could cast beginner and intermediate magic for it, but with simple familiars and mindless spirits being the only things they could conjure, they weren't quite the people Rudy was looking for. It was as if the entire field just wasn't well developed. In fact, out of all the people Rudy had met in his entire life, there was only one he could remember that had even a little bit of skill in summoning. He couldn't quite remember who it was, but he was sure if he ran into them again then he would remember. In any case, with that being the core limitation behind Rudy's research, there wasn't more he could do until Fitz had come forth with another way forward. It was after she'd asked the principal and vice principal that she was able to find out that there actually was someone in the guild who was studying summoning magic, an A-ranked member that went by the name of Silent Seven Star, a special student just like Rudius. If you're wondering what being an A-ranked member of the guild means, well, it's essentially the equivalent of being a branch manager. An S rank makes you part of the central leadership group, while the B rank naturally places you below both. That's not to say it doesn't still come with perks, because if any of these people were to start up a school for magicians, the guild would offer financial and logistical support no matter where they were. It was a pretty fleshed out hierarchy whose benefits Silent seemed to be taking advantage of. As for how she got that rank, well, that would be due to all her contributions to the school. First, she improved the menu by adding a curry lookalike called Carrie Soup, then she improved the public image by introducing uniforms. 
by leveraging connections she had with designers and manufacturers in Asura. Apparently, she had created her own supply line and distribution systems to make all of it happen, resulting in a more tasty dining menu, along with a student body that looked more like this unified group with a single purpose. It was a stark difference from the previous image of a chaotic mixture of all tribes and races. Aside from those, there were also plenty of other subtle innovations attributed to her. Minor things that were all very familiar. Sure, they were definitely new inventions here, but to Rudy this was something he'd been suspicious about for a while now. To him, Silent was a person whose origins were already apparent. The reason he'd never acted upon it until now, though, was because the very idea of someone like him existing was just incredibly frightening. So, whether it was wanting to believe that he alone was special, or the potential of being judged by someone who was given the same advantages as him, a person like Silent, like him, was someone he was trying to avoid. He was afraid they would view all the time he'd spent as wasted. Afraid that they would take their own success, compare it to what he had done, then ask why he didn't do more. So, it wasn't so much the idea of not being the only isekai person that scared him, but instead the idea that that person would criticize the way he's lived so far. To hear he didn't do enough would just be devastating, especially from a person who'd been given the same advantages, yet made significantly better use of them. That was the way that Rudy felt about it. It was only after he'd considered everything he'd done so far, though, that Rudy felt he could finally face her. In fact, he'd actually started to feel a bit cocky himself these days. So, if there was anything this silent person was going to look down on him for, it certainly wasn't going to be for anything he'd done while at the university. Now, when we get to the actual encounter with her, this whole display of trauma was exactly how the novel described it as. It was an incredibly accurate portrayal that depicted Rudy's PTSD perfectly. The only things worth adding are the thoughts that Rudy had while it was happening. There was a severe disconnect between what he wanted to do and what was actually happening. The legs he'd trained for moments exactly like this were running as fast as they could but only moved like they were in a dream. At first he thought Silent was just really fast, but it was moments later that he realized it was actually him that was just slow, leading to his inevitable tumble down the stairs. In the next scene where Fitz is asking Silent questions, there was a certain hostility from her that I think the anime failed to capture here. You see, rather than be mostly timid like how we saw, Fitz was both audibly and visibly aggressive. She was very clearly upset by the fact that Rudy was upset. Now, for this next part where Nanahoshi explains everything to Rudy, I believe it's very important to analyze everything. In a conversation like this, I think every detail matters. So, in addition to Silent mentioning how she didn't expect to meet Rudy here, she also used some peculiar wording in her next sentence. She spoke as if them meeting here together was fated, the nature of this route as determined by a flag set during their prior encounter all those years ago. This could just be a reference to common language used in visual novels or dating sims, but for a character that doesn't seem very much interested in that, I wouldn't expect her to be quite familiar with such. A quick distinction that needs to be made with one of Nanahoshi's responses to Fitz is the use of the word homeland instead of place here. Place implies that the two of them could have met anywhere, while homeland to Fitz means Fatoa. It's a minor change that makes Silphie's reaction all the more understandable. Now, it was after Nanahoshi revealed herself to be Japanese that confusion swirled through Rudy's mind as he tried to make sense of it all. He couldn't understand how 15 years had passed, yet she looked exactly the same. I mean, if she had reincarnated just like him, then there was no way her body and face would be the same way he remembered it. It was because it was, though, that Rudy realized her situation was entirely different. To him, the only explanation was that she had somehow warped here. It was in the time it took for Rudy to come to that conclusion that Nanahoshi would speed through several more questions, sometimes mixing in subtle remarks hinting at just how much she hated this world. These comments did rub Rudy the wrong way, but as someone who knew what it was like to despise the world around him, he completely understood the sentiment of it. So, despite Nanahoshi calling this world tedious and ridiculous, it was a point of view she had every right to possess. There was no need to try and change or correct that since Rudy understood where exactly it was coming from. He definitely could have worded his opposition to it a little bit better, but when asked to help find a way back, just the suggestion of the idea was enough to get a strong reaction out of him. He couldn't help but knock her hand away and immediately tell her that he never wanted to go back. It was a much more abrupt response than what we got in the anime, one that explains why Silent became so cautious of him after. Had he just accepted her request, then politely disagreed with her sentiment after, then that definitely would have made getting answers a lot more easy. 
But it was because he made a scene and had such a knee-jerk reaction that Nanahoshi would become a lot more wary of him. It was a natural response considering their priorities were direct opposite to each other. Now, Rudy wasn't so open to sharing details about his past life, but he was definitely okay with sharing stuff about his current one. He had opened up about how he'd been reborn and started his new life here, even mentioning how he'd died in an accident, but leaving out any details that could lead her to finding out what he really looked like. He felt revealing that would just make her think less of him. Appearances aside though, there was also the chance that she could blame him for her being here. So in the off chance that that did happen, Rudy didn't want to be hunted by her. It was in Nanahoshi's explanation of how she got here next that we get to the largest bits of cut content from the episode. Specifics that provide a lot more insight into both her circumstances and the teleportation incident. So, starting with the moment of her arrival, the place she appeared was essentially ground zero. It was the middle of an open field where nothing was around her and nobody was in sight. A place we can only assume is the very location the displacement incident originated from. It was a little bit later after this that Orsted would be the first to find her and take her under his protection, leading her on a journey all throughout Asura where she would eventually learn the language, the basics of magic, the economic system, and finally the people's lifestyles. It was a similar way of learning to the one that Rudy had taken. The only difference between her and him though was that in the years that it took Rudy to learn all that, Nanahoshi had done it in one, likely because of how important it was. Rudy figured that if you're traveling with a person who's cursed to be hated by everyone, it was probably best to learn how to do your own talking. So in the two years Nanahoshi had spent in Asura, she would manage to turn herself into quite the prominent businesswoman. She would earn money with her knowledge of Japanese cuisine and clothing, spend that money to obtain power, then use that power to make even more money, eventually securing herself several reliable streams of passive income. This wouldn't be that easy for the average person, but Nanahoshi had made sure to leverage Orsted's Dragon God title to the fullest. You see, just a single letter signed by him was enough to get meetings with pretty much anyone. Whether it be powerful merchants, famous mages, or even monarchs, any and all would come to the table if Orsted was the one who had made it for them. So it was once Nanahoshi was in the room with them that she would then use skillful negotiation to get what she wanted. For the cases involving her time in Asura, she had convinced some top merchants to arrange stable distribution routes for all her products, after which the money they would bring in would be enough to let her live the rest of her life in luxury. Of course, none of that really mattered to her since from the very beginning they were all stepping stones to find a way back home. So it was once that knowledge was gained and fortune made that Nanahoshi would leave Asura and travel with Orsted, venturing around the world in hopes of finding information on how to get out of here, that or anything of the two friends that could have been sent here with her. This duo would come across many fights as expected, but the single one that stood out was the one with Rudy. She couldn't say why Orsted hated the man god so much, but apparently his experience with him led him to the conclusion that it was always best to take out his apostles quickly. To let them go usually meant quite a bit of trouble later for him. Since Rudy knew he wasn't even one of these apostles though, he didn't really like the fact that he'd been murdered because of it. I mean, to him this wasn't even a feud that he was part of. So to lose his life over what was at best a misunderstanding was something Rudy wasn't quite ready to get over just yet. Now, one of the peculiar things Rudy found about Nanahoshi's story was the way that she was able to travel the world in only a year. Since his journey had taken somewhere around three, it didn't really make sense for hers to be done in one. No natural method would have allowed her to complete it that fast. So it was after Rudy inquired into it that Nanahoshi would explain that it was with the help of teleportation circles warping devices long thought to be destroyed several centuries ago. According to Nanahoshi though, there were actually quite a few that survived intact deep in the ruins that date back to the human demon war. So rather than walk from country to country, Orsted and Nanahoshi had instead gone from circle to circle, visiting whatever countries were on the path between one and the next. Rudy did ask where he could potentially find these ruins, but even if Nanahoshi knew, she wouldn't have said since Orsted had asked her to keep it a secret. Apparently, teleportation was a forbidden magic that not too many people should know about, something Orsted didn't want Nanahoshi talking about carelessly. Another secret Nanahoshi was told to keep was the identity of the person who suggested that she was summoned here. It was someone who was well known to be a world-class authority on summoning magic. They didn't want Nanahoshi saying that she had met them though, since if she did she would apparently be swarmed by greedy, power-hungry jackals people who likely wanted to gain an audience with this mystery person themselves. Despite this person being such an expert though, even they didn't know how it was possible to summon a human like this. 
Like, even if they set aside the whole another world thing, just the idea of summoning a living person was theoretically impossible. Even so, with this being the only lead for Nanahoshi to work with, she decided it was best to pursue it at the Renoa University of Magic. She would be recommended as a student by Orsted, provide an enormous donation strike to the guild, then use her expansive network and modern day knowledge to improve the schooling system. It was a series of contributions that would jump her straight to the A rank. The guild had even offered her an S rank, but that was under the condition that she share all her knowledge. An offer I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, she declined. Once again, the reasoning being that she wasn't interested in reforming this world for the better. She wasn't even concerned with improving her status. To her, the only thing that mattered was getting home. Now, though the anime makes it seem like getting erased is an actual possibility, the novels made it clear that this was all just speculation. There was no concrete evidence to support her claim, and the claims itself were just based off of science fiction novels. In any case, it was after Nanahoshi had secured her research facility that she would then devote herself to the study of summoning magic. It was a field whose foundation was heavily based on magic circles. From what she'd discovered so far, to create a magic circle you needed magic crystals and various ingredients to combine them with. The crystals would then be crushed and mixed with the ingredients, then the resulting paint would be used to draw patterns. Mana would then be pumped into the paint, and a certain magic effect would be produced depending on whatever patterns were drawn, after which the paint would evaporate and a new circle would have to be made. Where these magic circles start to get a bit tricky is with the variety of ingredients that change depending on the nature of the spell you're casting. So while you can theoretically cast any spell with a magic circle, certain powerful ones like those at the king tier and above start to require some very unusual catalysts for them. Like super rare items that require the financial support of a country to find. With that and the patterns being the core tenets of her research, they were all things that Nanahoshi had become quite the expert in. I'm not going to go into the specifics of why that is, but just know that after extensive experimentation, eventually she was able to come up with brand new magic circles of her own. A feat that many thought to be just straight up impossible these days. It was an impressive discovery that made even Rudy curious. One she unfortunately wasn't willing to share, because I'm sure you can only imagine the amount of time and research that was put into it. If Rudy helped her with her experiments though, that and any other knowledge she would be happy to give. Even if he had questions she didn't have answers to, so long as Rudy provided his world-class mana to help, Nanahoshi promised she would even use her connections to help answer them. She did after all know quite a few influential people, so it was a pretty fair offer that was beneficial to the both of them. Now, when we get to their discussion of the incident itself, while both the outburst and explanation were accurate, I'll just simplify what it is Nanahoshi was trying to say here. Whatever it was that brought her into this world, the displacement incident was likely a side effect of it. Since she was summoned here the moment everyone else was teleported, it only made sense that the two were correlated to each other. She couldn't say much else about why it happened, who had done it, or what their intentions were, but what she did know was that she was summoned here because of it. Even when she had asked Orsted about it, his only answer was that it was unprecedented. So, if a so-called god wasn't able to figure it out, then there was probably no chance Rudy or Nanahoshi could either. There was a time when the man-god had said that it was Orsted's fault, but Rudy wasn't so naive as to just blindly believe that. No. Instead, he attributed that blame to the curse which had made everyone hate Orsted. Perhaps Hitogami was under its effects too. That, or he was just blaming him because of their feud with each other. Either way, the truth of the displacement incident would have to remain a mystery for now. So, that was pretty much it for what was mentioned in the episode, but now that we know what we know about the teleportation incident, there is some cut content I feel needs mentioning from when it happened. You see, back in Season 1 when everyone was noticing it for the first time, there were three people who kind of shared a bit more insight on it. Orsted saw the mana pooling as madness and immediately decided to go investigate. Kashirika's demon eyes should have been able to see who was controlling it, but the fact that she couldn't meant that she could only deduce that it was summoning magic. Then the armored dragon Perugius, who deemed the light as a summoning too, determined the level of it to be far greater than anything he'd seen before. If anything, it was similar to when they had created Chaos Breaker, that being the epic name for the floating castle they're in. They don't explain much more than that, but based on what they said regarding Chaos Breaker and the light of summoning, I can only imagine that perhaps this floating castle was summoned into this world too. An incredible feat that likely required an absurd amount of mana just like how Nanahoshi's summoning did. 
But yeah, that's pretty much it for the episode. It was quite a bit of exposition, but I hope this video here helped you to understand it a bit more. If it did and you liked what you saw, then feel free to subscribe since I make these videos every week. For those who made it to the end, let me know in the comments what you thought about the reveal. Was it something you expected or something that you were surprised by? Now, before I go, I just wanted to remind you about the incredible Monster Hunter crossover in Arknights. It's collaborations like these that make the game so much fun and sponsors like them that really help to support the channel. So be sure to use the link in the description to download it for free on iOS and Android. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!